Hi Year 6, I'm going to continue reading Skellig for you today. Um, we're going to read chapters 4 to 6. I hope you're all comfortable and ready. I hardly slept that night. Every time I did drop off, I saw him come out the garage door and coming through the wilderness to the house. I saw him in my bedroom. I saw him come right to the bed. He stood there all dusty and white, with the dead blue bottles all over him. What do you want? He whispered. I said, what do you want? I told myself I was stupid. I'd never seen him at all. That I'd all been part of a dream as well. I lay there in the dark. I heard Dad snoring and when I listened hard I could hear the baby breathing. Her breathing was cracked and hissy. In the middle of the night, when it was pitch black, I dropped off again but she started bawling. I heard mum getting up to feed her. I heard mum's voice cooing and comforting. Then there was silence again and dad snoring again. I listened hard for the baby again and I couldn't hear her. It was already getting light when I got up and tiptoed into their room. Her cot was beside their bed. They were lying fast asleep with their arms round each other. I looked down at the baby. I slipped my hand under the covers and touched her. I could feel her heart beating fast. I could feel the thin rattle of her breath and her chest rising and falling. I felt how hot it was in there, how soft her bones were, how tiny she was. There was a dribble of spit and milk on her neck. I wondered if she was going to die. They'd been scared about that in hospital. Before they let her come home, she'd been in a glass case with tubes and wires sticking in her and we'd stood around staring in like she was in a fish tank. I took my hand away and took the covers around her again. Her face was dead white and her hair was dead black. They told me I had to keep praying for her, but I didn't know what to pray. Hurry up and get strong if you're going to, I whispered. Mum half woke up and saw me there. What do you want, love? She whispered. She stretched her hand out of bed, the bed towards me. Nothing, I whispered, and I tipped her back to my room. I looked down into the wilderness. There was a blackbird singing away on the garage roof. I thought of him lying behind the tea chest with the cobwebs in his hair. What was he doing there? I asked them again at breakfast what was going to happen to the garage now. When they're coming to clear it out, I said. Mum clicked her tongue and sighed and looked up at the ceiling. When we can get somebody to come, said Dad. It's not important, son. Not now. OK, I said. He was going to be off work today so we could get on with the house. Mum was taking the baby for more checkups at the hospital. Should I stay off so I can help? I said. Yes, he said. You can take Ernie's toilet out and scrub the floorboards round it. I'll go to school, I said, and I shoved my pat lunch into my sack and headed out. Before we moved, they asked me if I wanted to move school as well, but I didn't. I wanted to stay at Kenny Street High with Lee Keen Coot. I didn't mind that I'd have to get the bus through town. That morning, I told myself that it gave me time to think about what was going on. I tried to think about it, but I couldn't think. I watched the people getting on and off. I looked at them reading their papers or picking their nails or looking dreamily out of the windows. I thought, of, I thought how you could never just tell by looking at them what they were thinking or what was happening in their lives. Even when you got daft people or drunk people on buses, people that went on, stu on stupid and shouted rubbish or tried to tell you all about themselves. You could never really tell about them either. I wanted to stand up and say, there's a man in our garage and my sister's ill and it's the first day I've travelled from the new house to my old school. But I didn't. I just went on looking at all the faces and swinging back and forward when the bus swung around corners. I knew if someone looked at me, 
they'd know nothing about me either. It was strange being at school again. Loads had happened to me, but school just stayed the same. Rasputin still asked us to lift up our hearts and voices and sing out loud in assembly. The Yeti yelled at us to keep the, to the left in the corridors. Monkey Mitford went red in the face and stamped his feet when we didn't know our fractions. Miss Clark's got tears in her eyes when she told us the story of Icarus, how his wings had melted when he flew too close to the sun, and how he dropped like a stone past his father, Daedalus, into the sea. At lunchtime, Leaky and Cute argued for ages about whether a shot had gone over the line. I couldn't be bothered with it all. I went to the fence at the edge of the field and stared over the town towards where I live. While I was standing there, Mrs Dando, one of the auxiliaries, came over to me. She'd known my parents for many years. You OK, Michael? she said. Fine the baby. Find him. Not footballing today. I shook my head. Tell your parents I was asking, she said. She took a fruit gum out of her pocket and held it out to me. A fruit gum. It was what she gave the new kids when they were sad or something. Just for you, she whispered and she winked. No, I said. No thanks. And I ran back and did a brilliant sliding tackle on Coot. All day I wondered telling somebody about what I'd seen, but I told nobody. I said to myself, it had just been a dream. It must have been. At home, there was a hole in the floor where Ernie's toilet had been. It was filled with new cement. The plywood screen had gone. Ernie's old gas fire had been taken away and there was just a square black gap behind the hearth. The floor was soaking wet and it sank stank of disinfectant. Dad was filthy and wet and grinning. He took me into the wilderness. The toilet was standing there in the middle of all the thistles and weeds. Thought it'd make, it'd make a nice garden seat for us, he said. The gas fire and the plywood were down by the garage door, but they hadn't been taken inside. He looked at me and winked. Come and see what I found. He led me down to the garage door. Hold your nose, he said. He bent down and started to open a newspaper parcel. Ready? It was a parcel of birds. Four of them. Found them behind the fire, he said. Must have got stuck in the chimney and couldn't get out. You could make out that three of them were pigeons because of their grey and white feathers. The last one was pigeon shaped, but it was all black. This was the last one I found, he said. It was under a heap of soot and dust that had fallen down the chimney. Is it a pigeon as well? Yes. Been there a long, long time, that's all. He took my hand. Touch it, he said. Feel it, go on, it's okay. I let him hold my fingers against the bird. It was hard as stone. Even the feathers were hard as stone. Been there so long it's nearly a fossil, he said. It's hard as stone, I said. That's right. Hard as stone. I went and washed my hands in the kitchen. Today was okay, he said. Yes, Leaky and Coot said they might come over on Sunday. That's good. You manage the buses okay then? I nodded. Might be able to drive you there next week, he said, once we're sorted out a bit. It's okay, I said. Mrs Dando asked about the baby. You told her she was fine? Yes, I said. Good. Get some coke and a sandwich or something. I'll make tea when the others come home. Then he went upstairs to have a bath. I looked down through the wilderness. I waited for ages listening to Dad's bath water banging its way through the pipes. I got my torch off the kitchen shelf. My hands were trembling. I went out, past Ernie's toilet, the fire and the dead pigeons. I stood at the garage door and switched the torch on. I took a deep breath and tiptoed inside. I felt the cobwebs and the dust, and I imagined that the whole thing would collapse. I heard things scuttling and scratching. I had pa edged past the rubbish and the ancient furniture, and my heart was thudding and thundering. I told myself I was stupid. I told myself I'd been dreaming. I told myself I wouldn't see him again. But I did. 